you. All right, if you have your Bible, turn with me. Uh, we'll start in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, it's good. This is actually our last uh, night in this short series on integrity. We've just combined together with our youth and, and our adults. It's been a, a, a good time, a challenge for me, uh, an encouragement at the same time. And so uh, looking forward to finishing this up this evening. Let's do this. Let's just go ahead and we'll have a word of prayer. And then we'll jump into the word of God together tonight. Is it possible to get that screen on uh, for me to see? Right there? Maybe. All right. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. Uh, It is uh, good to be in your house tonight. Uh, Good to be able to gather uh, with my brothers and sisters and to bear uh, one another's burdens. Lord, we thank you just for the fellowship we have with one another. And we know that fellowship comes through Christ. Uh, I thank you for the salvation that is possible in him. And Lord, even tonight as we come, I'm, uh, Lord, I'm reminded of uh, how far short I fall of your glory. And I'm reminded once again of my great need of a Savior. Lord, I pray that uh, you would bless this time as we uh, come to this portion of the service where we open your word Uh, as we sang just a moment ago we pray speak O Lord Father give us eyes to see and ears to hear Lord for those who are yet without Christ Lord tonight may they see uh, may they see just the beauty of the gospel and turn and trust in him. But Father, I pray for us as your people that we might be conformed more to the image of Christ. Our heart's desire is to grow more like him. So may we be rooted deeply in your word. And we ask it all tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. Well, as we kind of finish up this study on integrity, I'm wondering tonight where you're at when it comes to this issue. You know, to the issue of integrity. Where where do you stand? We've, we've defined uh, integrity tonight as, let me see if I can get things moving. Here we go. Uh, uh, here's the definition, right? To live a life consistent with biblical principles, right? So that's been our definition all along. And so thinking through your own heart, thinking through your own mind as we've gathered together, you know, over these last several weeks, you know, When it comes to living a life that's consistent with the Word of God, how are you doing? Let me, you know, I I told you, in the New Testament, you won't come across this word integrity. Uh, It's very rare. uh, But does anybody remember what the word we see in the New Testament over and over again that would be the equivalent of the word for integrity? What is it? Trustworthy? Yeah. Uh, The one we mentioned the most that we see is the word faithfulness, right? You'll see it over and over. And, 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 and I, I want to remind you, right, that, that you're going to be judged according to your faithfulness, according to your, listen to the words of Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over Many things enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. If you're familiar with that account, you know, there, there's Jesus giving an estimation of a life based on faithfulness. And so we'll be judged on our integrity. And, and so tonight we're going to examine the life of man. You have your papers there. Uh, we're going to examine the life of Joseph, a man of integrity. And uh, this is helpful for us as we kind of think through We've talked about already uh, how we get there. If we're going to live lives of integrity, we need to put off sinful practices. And Troy talked about that a few weeks back. And then last week we talked about the need to put on Christ-like character, right? Christ-like character, Christ-like communication, Christ-like conduct. Our words and our deeds need to match up with, you know, you know, this desire to live like Christ. And so that's where we're heading tonight. We're going to talk about Joseph, Genesis chapter 37. And so the first thing we'll see tonight is that Joseph was a man, if I can get this moving here, there we go, was a man of personal integrity. Joseph was a man of personal integrity. We're coming to Genesis chapter 37, and I should probably give you 
a little bit of background, all right? Joseph grew up in what we would consider today a, a broken home. Uh, his mom died when, he, when she was giving birth to his little brother, Benjamin, but his dad had several wives, all right? And so Joseph was one of 12 brothers in the home, and uh, if, if you grew up with brothers and sisters and siblings, you know that you don't always get along, and, and, and that was certainly the case. Uh, Joseph was kind of uh, dad's favorite, and his brothers didn't like him very well for that. But what I want to see is I want to look at three of these brothers that grew up in the same home. Uh, you know, Jacob was their dad, and see how they react in their life. You know, what are the differences? The first one we'll see is in verses 12 to 14, and that's Joseph himself. Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse 12, says, Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to them, Here I am. Then he said, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. All right, so Joseph's dad says, Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers. And what does Joseph say? Here I am, right? And he goes, right? And so he's asked to do something, and he does it, right? And, and so he understands the importance of obeying uh, his, his father. And so that's, you know, we see this beginning here, right? Joseph has a desire to please his father. There's good intentions, but his good intentions are followed up with what? Good action, right? And so, you know, here, here we see a life of integrity, right? We're seeing a man who he's asked to do something and he does it. And I'm not going to take time to read all the way down through there, but Joseph follows through. And it's not easy to follow through on his dad's command because when he goes to find his brothers, his dad said they were in Shechem, they weren't there. And, but he doesn't stop, right? He says, I'm going to do what my dad asked me to do. And so he finds out where they're at and he follows up, right? So this is a young man who we see living a life of integrity. But let's go on to chapter 21 and 22. Now, if you're not, it, you, 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 may not you may not have been in church a whole lot, and you're not familiar with the account of what happens, but when Joseph finds his brothers, they're not very happy to see him. They see him coming from a long way off, and they know he's coming to check on them, and he's going to go back to dad, and he's going to say what? They weren't where they were supposed to be, right? You ever had a, a brother or sister tell on you, you know, you were doing something you weren't supposed to do, and and they told mom and dad, well, that's, what's, that's what they know is going to happen. Right? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about killing your brother or sister in that moment, but when Joseph's coming, that's exactly what crosses their mind, right? This is dad's favorite. And, and again, if you're not familiar with the account, you have to kind of read. And Joseph has had dreams where he said, you're going to serve me one day. And, and so when they see Joseph coming, they come up with a plan to kill him. All right, so that's kind of where we're coming in. And now look at verse 21 and 22, and we see Joseph's brother Reuben. Right? Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many collars that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. All right, so here we have Reuben. All right, now, let me ask you, is Reuben a man of integrity? All right, so we got a, we got a head shaking no. Now, come on, his brother said what? Let's kill him, and Reuben says, don't kill him. And what was his plan? His plan was to come back and save him, right? So why not a man of integrity? He, wanted, he had good intentions. What's the problem? Hey, he knew it was wrong. What would have been the way to handle that situation with integrity? All right. Rather than come up with a scheme to come back and save him later, the right thing would have been what? Yeah. Let's, this is wrong. We're not going to kill our brother. We're not going to throw him in a pit. You know? But, so there's good intentions, right? So many times in our life, we have good intentions, but either, I think Reuben was a coward. You know, he was afraid to stand up to his brothers. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think he knew the right thing to do. And so rather than do the right thing, he came up with, really, it was, he was trying to deceive his own brother so he could come back and save Joseph, right? So good intentions, but improper action, right? Now, let's follow along with the flow here. Look at verse 25, or I'm, I'm sorry, verse 26 and 28. Right, now we come to Judah, right? Verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. All right? Man of integrity? Not at all. Right? Judah's plan is what? What good does it do if we kill him? Let's sell him. And we'll make a profit. Right? And, and so he says we shouldn't kill him. Why? Because he's her brother. <laughs> right? he, he makes it sound like he's being loving and kind. This is our brother. Don't kill him. Let's sell him. All right? And, and, and so that's, that's what's happening here. And so here we have evil intentions. Here's the thing. Tonight, you're probably going to fall into one of these areas, right? You're going you're, 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 you're to fall into a good intentions, proper actions, good intentions, improper actions, or you're just going to fall into the evil intention category, right? So we see that kind of playing out. And, and I want you to think tonight about those people in your life that you would consider to be people of integrity, right? So we've seen three different men here, Joseph and Reuben and Judah. But think with me tonight, each of you, get somebody in your mind, somebody in your head who you would consider to be a person of integrity. You got someone? All right, now, let me ask you the question. What is it about those people that stand out? What is it about that person that you have in your mind that, that says, this is a person of integrity? They're truthful, right? So when they speak, you know they're speaking the truth. All right. So if they say they're going to do something, they do it, right? So you can count on them. If, if something comes out of their mouth, they're going to follow through. What else? Helpful, right? Helpful to others, right? They're going to be someone that can be depended upon when there's a need. Do the right thing when nobody's looking, all right? We're going to talk about that a little bit. Anybody up here have anything different? You got somebody in your mind. What stands out? They're caring, all right? Looking out for the needs. All right, so when we start talking about People of integrity. Things start to begin to, to really, you know, to come together, right? This is somebody who is truthful, somebody who's honest, somebody who can be counted upon, depended upon to do what they say they're going to do. So let's think through that. What about you? Right? Can you be counted on? Are you trustworthy? Would someone consider you to be a person of integrity? You know, when, the reason that somebody came to your mind when you, when you said, who's a person of integrity? They have made a name for themselves, right? So when you think of that person, you think of someone who is honest. You think of someone who can be counted upon. And so my question for you tonight is, what's your reputation? Because when we start talking about integrity, that's what, you know, what people think of you is, now I want to be careful, right? Because we don't, but what people think about you says a lot about your testimony, right? It matters. And so, you know, how can you determine where you stand? And, and I'm just going to ask you some questions, and you don't have to answer out loud, but think through these in your mind. Right? So we're looking at Joseph, a man of personal integrity, but what about you? Do people trust you with important or confidential information? Do people trust you with important or confidential information? Do your relationships with others grow deeper the longer they know you? Or do they grow strained as people learn what you're really like? Do an increasing number of people trust you? One last one. Do people recommend you for significant or difficult tasks without fear of you letting them down can you be counted on are you 
reliable. What we see is Joseph was a man who could be counted on. All right, now, I want to move quickly because we're going to run out of time tonight. But we also see, not only was Joseph a man of personal integrity, but Joseph was a man of public integrity. And I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of survey a little bit. If I take time uh, to turn to all these, and we're, going to, we're just going to, we're going to run out. So Genesis chapter 39, verses 4 through 6, all right, we see a man named Potiphar. Right, Potiphar is the man who bought Joseph. Right? Joseph was sold into slavery. Potiphar bought him, brought him into his home as a slave. And in verse 4 of chapter 39, it says, Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. All right? Right, so that's Potiphar, the man who bought Joseph out of slavery. Next, we're going to see a warden in prison. And I don't know if we'll have time to explain that, but in Genesis chapter 39, down in verses 22 to 23, is the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. All right, so we have Potiphar, we have the warden, and then lastly we have Pharaoh himself in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 41. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now, I just I wanted to go through that quickly, but what we see here is a picture, right? Three different men who have, they have watched Joseph's life. And they have seen in Joseph a man who can be counted on. And because they can count on him, what do they do? They place him in a a position of authority. Joseph, in Potiphar's home and in in the jail and in Pharaoh's, over the whole land of Egypt, he was placed in a position where they said, I'm entrusting everything to you, and I know I don't have to worry about it. I know, you know, Potiphar's a good example. He says, Besides the bread that he ate, right? He would show up for dinner, and everything was taken care of. He knew that his home, his business, was in good hands with Joseph. I mean, who do you entrust your home to? Who do you entrust your business to? A man of integrity, right? And and so that's what we see here. In each instance... Joseph's integrity was evident, but it's a reminder to each of us. Do you realize people are watching you? They're watching how you handle yourself. They're watching how you take care of things. And trust me, right, Christian or non-Christian, people are looking for individuals with integrity uh, out in the world. There, There are... There are business owners. You know, there are managers who are hiring, who are looking for individuals with integrity. It's not easy to find. It's not, I, you know, I, I've, I've, I've talked with employers. I, I've talked with people who interview you know, individuals. It's not easy to find someone who is an individual, a person of integrity. And so this is vital to remember. People are Watch you. You may not realize it, but you know, uh, college administrators and employers—they're—they're they're looking at your Facebook page. Right? Uh, so, you know, so you have to understand. Remember, we said this last week, right? This area of integrity extends to every single area of your life. So, we talked about Christ-like communication. Communication is not only the words you speak, but it's any kind of social media that you use whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, everything, everything that's out there on the Internet is available for the world to see. That might cause you to pause for a moment and, and, to, and to consider what you post, what you say, how you say it. 
because it affects the way people view you. Now, again, I want to get to the, you know, the most important thing is not how people view you, right? We'll see that as we continue. The most important thing is how the Lord sees you. But let's, let's keep moving here. We're going to run out. All right. Joseph was a man of private integrity, a man of private integrity. So you can pass the personal test, and you can pass the public test. But there's one more that we wanted to look at tonight, right? You can, you can, you can kind of have people fooled, right? We talked about that last week. You can fool your parents. You can fool those in authority. You know, you can kind of present yourself in one way before the public. But what do we see? The true, oh, man, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The true test of integrity comes when no one is watching, right? It's one thing to maintain your image when everyone is looking. But how do you act when no one else is around? You, you heard the old saying, right? When the cat's away, the mice will play. <laughs> yes. All right. So, right, you know, does your integrity stand the test when your parents aren't home? When the teacher's out of the room? When the boss is not there? I remember, I remember working uh, at, at a place, I, again, I won't say the name, but uh, I remember that working the midnight shift was drastically different than working the day shift. And the reason the midnight shift was so different than the day shift was because there were no managers there at midnight. In the daytime, managers and owner was there. In midnight, it was just the employee. And, and I, I have to be honest, things were a little crazy on the midnight shift. Right? Things happened that would not have happened on the day shift, right? And so the, the, you know, the question for, for you tonight as we think through this is, in those moments when no one is around, Do you pass the private test of integrity? When you're on the computer by yourself, right? nobody's there, no chance of getting caught, what websites do you visit? What kind of movies do you watch? And, and we could run down this road for a long time, right? Right? When no one is around, do you do the things that you know you should not do? When the boss is away, is that your opportunity to relax, take a break, not work? One of the, one of the greatest complaints that I hear from employers is that people just don't work. They're paying someone for 40 hours in a week, but they're not getting 40 hours in a week out of their employers or out of their employees. And, and so, you know, if we're going to be people of integrity, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, it's at school, we need to be individuals who we give all of ourselves to the task at hand. All right, so let's, let's quickly, because here's what we're going to see. In those moments where you're all alone, your integrity will be tested. And so we see three ways in which it's going to be tested, all right? First of all, your integrity can be tested suddenly. Right? Go back to Genesis 39, look at verse 7 with me. So Joseph's in the house of Potiphar, right? He's been placed over the entire home. Everything's in his care. Now, I didn't read the end of verse 6. It says Joseph was a handsome, handsome in form and appearance, all right? He's a good-looking guy. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Now, if you're not familiar with biblical language, she's not asking him to take a nap, all right? She, she's saying, sleep with me, have sex with me, right? This is the wife of Potiphar, his boss. Boss is away, has no concern, no care for his home. Joseph, come sleep with me. Now, let me ask you, in that situation, could Joseph have got away with it? 
absolutely he could have got. He's in charge of the entire house. Everybody was under his authority. He could have gave everybody a job outside the home and left himself completely alone with Potiphar's wife, and nobody would have known any different. How does Joseph respond? Look at verse 8. He refused. He refused. He said no. All right, now, some of you, I know, because I know how this works, because we, we try and justify, right, well, well, Potiphar's wife must have been one ugly lady, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, l- l- listen, Potiphar was a man of power and authority, right? And, and he probably was an older gentleman, but he would have had a young wife, and by every standard, she would have been considered beautiful. Right? That would have been common practice in Egypt. So this is, this is not, oh, man, he, you know, man, she's a dog. I don't want anything to do with her, right? This was a man of integrity who said, I refuse. And why? Why did he refuse? He says, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What does he say? Two things, really, right? Number one, my master trusts me. Right? Potiphar trusts me. He's, he's placed everything under my care. It's all here, except for you. You're his wife. You're his wife. How could I do this thing? But he doesn't say and sin against Potiphar. He says, how could I do this thing and sin against God? Right? So, the motivation behind Joseph's integrity is he knows he's going he's to give an account to the Lord. Right? It, their tradition says this, that when, and, and I, you know, I can't give scripture for this, but tradition says that when Joseph said, I can't sin against God, that, that uh, Potiphar's wife took her blouse and covered the household God, the, the, eye, the, the head, you know, the eyes, and she said, there, he can't see. And Joseph said, my God sees. My God sees, right? And, and, and so Joseph has an understanding that, and if you, if you need evidence of that, go to Psalm 139, right? <laughs> Psalm 139 is a beautiful picture of, you know, the Lord knows every word from your tongue before you speak it. Where can I go from your presence? <laughs> Nowhere. I can't flee from your presence, right? God sees all. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, right? and, and so you have that beautiful picture uh, and it's a great encouragement to your heart, but at the same time, it's a reminder that God sees everything. God knows everything, and he is everywhere. And so there's no time where we're outside of those private moments when mom and dad aren't around and teachers aren't around. God is there. And Joseph says, I cannot sin against God. He'd been developing this integrity over the years. And had he not, he would have never survived this temptation. Now, that's sudden. It can come very quickly, right? And there's going to be times where you have no, no intention of looking for sin, no intention of looking for temptation, and it comes. I mean, Joseph was just going around his everyday duties, right? And all of a sudden, there's Potiphar's wife saying, get over here. And, and you know, there's going to be times where you're surfing the internet, and there's a, there's a link, there's an ad that pops up that you weren't looking for, right? but it's there. And that temptation is going to be there. And so in those moments, what do you do? You refuse. You refuse. But it doesn't go away. Persistently, there will be opportunities for your integrity to be tested. Look at verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 10. It says, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her her, to lie with her or be with her. So, right, I have have a feeling that Potiphar's wife was not a lady who was used to being refused. She was a lady who was used to getting her way. And the fact that Joseph turned her down, I believe, made her want him all the more. Day after day after day. She says, Joseph, come lie with me. Joseph, come lie with me. And day after day after day, persistently, the temptation comes, and he refuses her. 
And, and he takes a further step. Not only does he refuse her, but then he says, I refuse to be with her. I'm going to make sure I'm not around her. I'm, not going, to make sure, I'm going to make sure I'm not in her presence. I'm going to avoid the temptation altogether. Right. This is one of the greatest steps you can take in a life of integrity. Right. You know when you're alone that you are vulnerable to temptation. So take the proper steps to avoid the temptation. Right? That's what we see happening here. Let's look at one more. The last one is aggressively. Right? It's really a combination of the two. Suddenly, persistently, in verses 11 and 12. It happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. There was our problem, right? Nobody else was around. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. This was, <laughs> yeah, this was not subtle, right? Potiphar's wife just grabs a hold of him by his robe and pulls him to herself. And what does Joseph do? <laughs> he runs. He runs. And, and when he runs, she just pulls his cloak right off of him. And he keeps on running. Now, you know the outcome, right? Did Joseph do the right thing? Absolutely. Did it work out? Not so great for Joseph, right? Potiphar's wife, she makes up a story, right? She calls all, she screams, she calls all the servants in, says, this man tried to rape me. She tells Potiphar he tried to rape me. Potiphar puts Joseph in prison because of what she said he did. He was falsely accused of wrong doing, right? So Joseph's response was right. He was a man of integrity. Now, I, I, you know, when temptation comes suddenly, aggressively, what's the proper response? Run. Run, right? That's, that's what the instruction we get always from the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lust. Okay? All right, so you have those responses we're just going to finish up here very quickly. We see Joseph's integrity. It had been tested over time and proved to be genuine. His life was consistent with biblical principles. And if you follow his life from, you know, you start in Genesis 35, you go to Genesis chapter 50. If you follow his life, you see a man of integrity, a man who was consistent. Was he perfect? No, nah, not at all, right? Not at all. But... Joseph was a man who points us to one who is perfect, right? And so that's your last little point there, right? Joseph's life points us to Jesus, right? Now, I asked you how you're doing when it comes to this area of integrity. I'm going to be just straight up with you. Right, this has been hard for me. It's difficult for me to talk about integrity. Okay? You, you, hear the, you hear the old, you know, the old f phrase, practice what you preach. That is one of the, man, everybody's putting everything away. <laughs> That's one of the most difficult things for me to stand up before you every single Sunday, every Wednesday, and say, here's what the Word of God says. Here's, here's how we're supposed to, this is what God expects of us as His people. And then to examine my own heart and see that I'm not there. I'm struggling. I'm, I'm failing. I'm, I'm a mess in some areas, all right? So I just, you need to know that. And, and, and so as we look at this life of Joseph, a man of integrity, he wasn't perfect, but he does point forward to one. So although I've been convicted as we talk about integrity, I'm also encouraged as we talk about in integrity because I mentioned it last week, right? There is one who lived the life I could not live. You say, how does Joseph point us to Jesus? Well, the correlations are numerous, and uh, I wish we had more time to look at them and just kind of trace them out. But see, I told you Joseph was a man who told his brothers that they would all bow down before him. What did Philippians 2.11 says? One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody will bow down before 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> Joseph was a man who was despised and rejected by his brothers. Jesus was despised and rejected by his own brothers and by his own people. And yet he maintained his integrity. He was a man who was tempted, yet did not give in to the temptation. He was a man who God sovereignly ordained to rescue and save his people. He was a man who was sinned against, but forgave those who sinned against him. You see the picture? All of this points to Christ. This is who Jesus is. And so for me, as I kind of finish up this, yes, convicted, I, I'm not the man that I should be, and if you're honest, you're not either. However, he who began a good work in me will complete it. He will complete it, right? That I am being transformed from one shade of glory to another. I'm being conformed more to the image of Christ day by day by the power of the gospel. Let me say this. I can be encouraged because I know Christ. I can be encouraged because of the work of the gospel. But it's possible here tonight and you, have, you don't have that encouragement because you don't know Jesus. There's never been a time in your life where you understood your sinfulness, you understood your need of a Savior, and you put your trust in Jesus Christ to save you. And, and I would say this, and... The emphasis tonight has been on the life of a believer, living out a life of integrity. But if you're here tonight and you've never trusted in Christ, my plea with you would be before you leave this place is to get things right with the Lord. I'd love to talk to you more. I'd love to open up the Word and share with you how you can know Jesus Christ. But my encouragement for us as the people of God is that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness, that we would let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Let us live lives that point people to Christ as we leave this place. So, <laughs> well, let's go ahead and we'll close in prayer tonight. Father, I want to thank you for uh, your word. I thank you most of all tonight for the power of the gospel. Lord, uh, over these last few weeks as we've talked about integrity, we were reminded of how far short we fall and, uh, Lord, our, our need of Christ. And yet I pray that we would uh, pursue righteousness. Lord, that we would be a people who point to Christ with our life and, Lord, I pray for those in our midst tonight who are lost, who have no hope, no encouragement in the gospel. Father, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit might draw them to yourself. Lord, that work is a work that only you can do. So we leave that in your hands, and we just ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And amen.